Uh, good afternoon and welcome to our annual IIEA European Commission seminar on the EU's country specific recommendations or CSRs for Ireland. We have a distinguished and varied panel of speakers this afternoon presenting perspectives on the recommendations from the Irish government of the European Commission and a discussion of the recommendations implications for Irish workers, business and the economy with leaders from ICTU, IBEC and the ESRI. To begin, Helen McEntee, Minister for European Affairs, will speak to us for about 15 minutes, and then we'll go to a Q&A with the Minister. You'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see at the bottom of your screens. The Minister has to leave us to attend another meeting at one o'clock, uh, so that will be, uh, that's a hard deadline, so please get your questions and comments in early uh, for her. At one o'clock, then Declan Costello, one of the most senior Irish officials in Brussels, who is Deputy Director General of the European Commission's Directorate General for Economic and Financial Affairs, will discuss some of the recommendations and he'll also update us on EU level responses to the pandemic. We'll then go to our panel, uh, Patricia. Patricia King, General Secretary of ICTU, Danny McCoy, CEO of IBEC, and Professor Alan Barrett, Director of the ESRI. They'll give their responses and comments on the recommendations, and then we'll open up for a further Q&A with the panelists. Uh, a reminder that the entire event today is on record, and with that, I'll hand over to you, Minister McEntee. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Dan, and good afternoon to everyone. Um, thank you to you and your team for, for inviting me to be part of this. Um, and I suppose to congratulate you as well on, on hosting these series of discussions. Uh, I think it's really important while we can't meet in person and, and I don't think you can ever replace that person-to-person that -person engagement, um, particularly given the current situation we find ourselves in, the challenges that we're faced, but also the, the need to examine and to critically, critically analyze the challenges that we're going to face in the coming weeks and months. These kind of discussions I think are really, really important. So to, to acknowledge the other uh, speakers in case they're on when I'm gone or we don't get to, to say hello again. Uh, Declan from the Commission, Alan, uh, Patricia and, and Danny as well. I've had a chance to meet with some of them in person in recent weeks, uh, others not, but look, hopefully we, we'll all get a chance to engage properly uh, as things ease up and uh, as our economy and our society starts to recover. Um, if I could maybe just set the scene a little bit as to, to where we are in Ireland, what the economic situation looks like and, and maybe a little bit of the economic uh, and indeed the, the overall response from the EU because I think it, it does set the, the picture for uh, the current situation for the recommendations that have been made and, and why they have been made, um, particularly in light of the COVID crisis. Uh, if we look at uh, the unprecedented economic and social challenges that COVID has presented us with uh, in recent weeks and months. Uh, we look at the overall figures today and, and while it might sl change slightly because we have obviously a, a lot more people getting back to work today, which is fantastic. Um, but as of yesterday, there were 1.1 million people in Ireland on some form of government payment. So whether it was through the pandemic unemployment payment, the wage assist scheme or, or various other government payments that they might have been on before now, that equates to about 26.1, I think, percent of our overall population, our working population, which is a massive figure. If you compare that to the economic crash 10 years ago, we had a height of about 16% unemployment, 22% maybe for younger people, which that type of figure was replicated across the EU, but it's a significant figure and, and really highlights the, 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 the complicated uh, situation we find ourselves in um, and, and the complex, um, I suppose the complexities of, of COVID and, and uh, the work that we need to do. Similarly, if you look at the exchequer returns for May, uh, we've recorded a deficit of almost 6.1 billion euro. Again, an unprecedented kind of figure, a number, but what this uh, I think reflects is the huge amount of support that the government has put in place to try and support business, uh, industries, individual citizens, uh, so that we can limit job uh, losses, we can limit um, income loss, that we can keep employers and employees connected, uh, but that that we can also preserve the economic activity in general. If we look at GDP, it's expected to fall uh, by 10.5% this year, while modified domestic demand is expected to fall 
by 15% this year alone. So, you know, this is the, the, the scale of what we're dealing with. Uh, you also have to take into account, and I don't think I need to explain to anybody on the line, uh, the potential implications of a no trade deal Brexit, which is also coming uh, at us at a very quick uh, rate at the moment. Um, we've had four rounds of negotiations, and again, it's very difficult to have these kind of negotiations where you can't meet face to face. But after four rounds of negotiations, uh, we are seeing very little progress, whether it's on the area of level playing field, whether it's on fisheries, whether it's on governance and, and many key issues. Um, and the result of, of little progress in that area potentially means that by the end of this year, uh, where we had hoped to see a, a projected decrease in our unemployment figures, uh, suddenly being hit with potential implications of a no trade deal Brexit. So we have to take all of these issues into account. We also have to ensure uh, that the withdrawal agreement, um, and in particular the Northern Ireland Protocol, uh, as has already been agreed, is implemented in full. Uh, and to date, we haven't seen a lot of detail from the UK to ensure that by the end of this year, uh, that will be implemented in full. But obviously we're, we're working with the Commission uh, and hoping that the UK UK will come forward with greater details. So this is a very difficult and a very challenging uh, road that we find ourselves on and obviously provides the context, as I've said, for this year's European semester uh, and for our country-specific recommendations. If I could maybe just touch on, on the EU's response to COVID-19, uh, I, I know it will be discussed maybe a little bit more in detail later, um, but I think what's different here to, to the last time we faced an economic crisis is that Ireland is not facing this alone. Uh, every single member state is in the same situation, albeit potentially at a, a different stage or, or at a different scale or level. Um, but this is a challenge that's shared by all member states within the European Union. Uh, as noted, if, uh, for those who hadn't seen it in the Commission's spring economic forecast, GDP for the EU27 uh, is expected to decline by 7.4% this year for the, Euro, for the Euro area. The Commission uh, has also foreseen a drop of 7.7% uh, in GDP. What's clear is that this is a crisis, um, a challenge again of unprecedented scale that we face jointly, which means there needs to be a joint response to it. Uh, and I do take uh, and accept, and I think the Commission has accepted uh, some criticisms that perhaps the response was not quick enough, uh, that there wasn't uh, enough done for member states. But I, I would very much point to the fact that this was a, a crisis, the size, the scale and the speed of which uh, we have never seen before. Uh, and I think for each, uh, member states, uh, I suppose we responded in, in a way that we felt uh, we had to, but very quickly the Commission has come together. We have uh, seen a massive response, uh, not just in establishing a single market task force, which has uh, allowed for any blockages and the single market movement of goods, people, essential services to open up. We've seen the Commission uh, support the repatriation of over 500,000 EU citizens. Uh, we've seen a mass coming together of, of financial support, but also some of the brightest minds in the EU to try and actually deal with this pandemic in, in identifying um, a, a cure to it. Um, but significantly and I think most importantly uh, we've seen massive measures and financial supports already been put in place and more to come uh, hopefully which we'll be able to agree in the coming months. You have a three-pillared approach um, as part of this economic response. Firstly the triggering uh, of the general escape clause of the stability and growth pact uh, of which Ireland has already benefited significantly from the endorsement by the European Commission uh, or the Council in April uh, of the three safety nets. This is the, the suite of uh, loans that were um, agreed of 540 billion for our member states, for citizens, for businesses, uh, through the shore, the, the ESM and the, the EIB mechanisms. And then finally, and I think significantly in the last two weeks, the Commission has presented uh, a very ambitious and quite a large um, suite of measures through firstly the next MFF, which is uh, proposed to be 1.1 trillion euro. Uh, but secondly, on top of that 750 billion euros worth um, of grants and loans, more uh, potentially towards loans in this instance. And why this is significant, I think, um, is because this really shows solidarity among member states. Ireland was one of nine member states uh, to seek corona bonds, as they were called at the time, but essentially to ensure that those member states that are hardest hit that they are supported, that any type of measure, that it's ambitious, that it's targeted, that it's timely, that it's temporary. And we feel that uh, the proposal by the Commission really does uh, feed into all of those areas. Uh, the recovery package will be a front-loaded investment. It, it's planned that it would be funded through a once-off Commission borrowing on the markets. Um, again, an exceptional kind of response for an unprecedented circumstances. So overall, um, 
these are going to be important measures in how we all respond and how all member states take on board, not just the recommendations, but how we, I suppose, feed them into the, the plans that we've already implemented as well. Um, we also have to take into account not just um, the, the COVID response, but our general priorities as well as, as countries and as member states. And we look at the MFF and my, my own colleagues in the EU uh, will hear me every single time I speak, whether it's about the MFF or not, uh, stress the need for there to be a fully funded cap uh, for our farming community, for our rural communities to be supported. Uh, and while I would welcome the additional 15 billion that has been highlighted in the Pillar 2 package uh, through the, the Next Generation Recovery package, uh, there are many other uh, programmes that we need to see uh, fully supported, whether it's cohesion, whether it's uh, additional funding for uh, Peace Plus, which is uh, significant for us in Northern Ireland, uh, jobs recovery packages, uh, research investment, uh, so many different areas. So, you know, th there's a lot of things that we need uh, and we would like to see further detail on and, and we're analysing at the moment. Um, the President of the European Council would obviously like to see an agreement on this by the time EU leaders meet uh, in person in July. Um, obviously, that's a very ambitious timeline given the, the, the amount of work that needs to be done, but I suppose the amount of analysis and the fact that uh, we need to be, to be honest here, not everybody maybe agrees with how this should be funded and, and the type of mechanisms that should be put in place. Um, but we are fully committed, as I know all of our colleagues are, to try and finding a solution as quickly as possible and, and to try and ensuring that we have a coordinated response to this crisis. And this is where obviously the, the European semester can bring great value um, through the annual cycle. Really, it's, it's a mechanism through which we can coordinate our policies to try and improve our growth, our, our social prospects for all member states, to advance uh, our overall shared responsibilities, to bring about sustainable growth uh, and future employment opportunities for the benefit of each and every one of us. Um, as we look to the end of the 2020 cycle, it's uh, important to reflect on the process. And if we look at this year, we saw a number of new features in the semester process, most notably, uh, firstly, an increased focus on sustainability, um, but also a particular focus uh, of integration of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, Ireland's 2020 country specific report very clearly says that we are making progress, um, particularly in the implementation of the 17 SDGs towards achieving our overall goals by 2030. But there is, of course, um, still work to do. This is something we, we, we very much support. We, we have an implementation plan for this in Ireland, uh, which is due to come to a finish this year. But hopefully we will have a new implementation plan from next year onwards as to how we can achieve those goals, uh, but how we can support uh, programmes that help us to, to get to that. Um, we'll also continue, obviously, to, to advocate for the implementation of them at an international level and also at, a, at the European level as well. We would also welcome the increased role um, that the semester is playing in supporting uh, and trying to reach our climate ambitions. And this is something that obviously uh, is, and we are asking for it to underpin any kind of uh, a recovery. Ireland was one of 18 member states, our Minister for Climate, Richard Bruton, um, to call for any uh, economic recovery or, or social recovery to be underpinned by the uh, European Green Deal. And I think we now have an opportunity to, to press and I say opportunity, I suppose, unfortunately, in these current circumstances, but to press a restart button in many instances to use this as an opportunity uh, to change our structures, to change our systems, but also to potentially change how we think, because I think a lot of this is, is changing a mindset and changing our own approach. And, you know, if you take something as simple as each of us in our individual uh, lives, our environments and our workplaces, we have all had to adapt, we've all had to change to the current uh, situation, we're probably all on Zoom uh, more times than we had ever been in our life before now, um, but it has been an opportunity to adapt and to change uh, and, and to advance the digital transition as well much quicker than we ever thought possible. Um, so this is, uh, you know, I suppose an opportunity to do that and, and we see that increased role uh, through the semester in, in supporting these efforts. In our own country specific recommendations, uh, maybe just to touch on and, and to acknowledge and to welcome some of them, a particular strong focus on the need for us in our response to the COVID pandemic, um, addressing the labour market participation, education and skills development support for SMEs, um, and again, investment with a particular focus on sustainability. These are key to the economic recovery, which uh, is to come and, and we hope will come as quickly as possible. We also in particular uh, would welcome the cross-cutting approach that's been taken by the Commission to try and shape um, a truly pan-European economic response to this. 
we're obviously looking at how we can cooperate better when it comes to our healthcare systems. And this is something that uh, maybe is new as well. So you look at um, the, the, the next generation package, which has been um, presented at the 750 billion euro fund, sustainability, the digital economy is at the heart of this, but also a new and renewed focus on our health uh, sectors. There's a proposal to spend 9.1 billion euro on trying to make sure that we have capabilities to respond to a crisis like this in the future, but that we are perhaps better connected and, and able to, to, to engage with each other at a European level, because of course uh, our, our health systems are national competencies, so it creates somewhat of a challenge in that regard. In terms of the overall response at, an, at a government level, we are of course um, discussing and, and debating the country specific recommendations, um, including this will be discussed at, at the next European Council, which will take place later on this month via video conference by our leaders. Um, we we'll consider uh, all of them. We will, as always, take on board uh, the recommendations that have been made. And I suppose you have to take into account the political situation we find ourselves in Ireland as well, in that we are currently. Uh, my own party with uh, the Fianna Fáil party and Green Party is trying to form a new government, a new programme for government, very much minded by um, these recommendations, by the need to change and to adapt, to respond to COVID, but to not just have a short term plan, to have a longer term uh, economic and social plan as well. So these will very much underpin, uh, I think, a lot of the work that's been done. And you know, look, hopefully we will have uh, some form of a government sooner rather than later, because I really think to, to be able to get moving on implementation uh, of so many things that will be needed in the coming weeks and months, we, we need a, a strong government with a strong mandate. Finally, just I, I suppose to maybe say in terms of uh, the, the, the overall um, semester process back in 2010, um, the European Commission proposed a new programme for member states, which uh, would allow essentially a greater coordination among economic policies. Very soon after that, then the financial crisis was revealed the very clear need for that, for greater collaboration coordinates, uh, for a more coherent economic um, governance system at an EU level, where we find ourselves today, again, in somewhat of a similar crisis, albeit a very different situation. The very same tools are what we rely on to try and help uh, not just ourselves in Ireland to, to recover, um, but for all of us to engage in and to recover um, at the same time. So we are fully supported to the European semester process um, and, and we will continue to engage with the Commission to play our part, to work with our European colleagues and um, to ensure that we all emerge from this stronger, that we emerge from this together, because there is absolutely no point uh, in 10 or 20 or 25 member states uh, getting through this, our economies recovering our societies getting back to normal if we're leaving anybody behind and so that is our ultimate goal and objective that we get through this together uh, and when it comes to Ireland that we support business industries and sectors uh, to get through this as quickly as we can. So Dan, um, probably gone on for longer than I was supposed to but thank you very much for the opportunity to engage with you and, and thank you to everyone uh, who's online this afternoon for, for tuning in and hopefully now we have a chance for a few questions. Good, thank you. Yeah, um, thank you, Minister. I see they're coming in already. We've got 300 people uh, joining us at this point, so I'm sure we'll have uh, lots more than we can deal with in the 12 minutes. Let me throw one to you straight away. Um, issues around state aids and level playing fields. This is a hugely important thing in the Brexit context, but the pandemic has brought it to the 27 in a way that nobody might have ever anticipated. Effectively, the, the rule book has gone out the window. Is there a concern in government around that? Some other governments may have more resources to help uh, help their, their businesses. Um, any concern about how that affects the level playing field across the 27 and what sort of pathway do you see back to some sort of normality uh, and over what time frame? Well, I suppose that the last question is, it's difficult to predict any kind of a time frame, As you say, a lot of the rules it's not that they've gone out the window, but I think there has been a flexibility created that is absolutely necessary, given the crisis that we're all facing. And, and you know, the fact that this is not just one or two member states, everybody is impacted, albeit perhaps maybe at a different scale and at a different time. Um, so we needed that flexibility. And I think the EU uh, response was quite quick in allowing that. Um, Ireland alone has benefited, I think, to the tune of 400 million already because of that flexibility and that ability to go beyond uh, what would be the normal rules. Um, I mean, you, you, you have to, I suppose, look at the fact that, you know, and, and I was asked this question last week around breaching the deficit limits, what will the consequences be? How do we, you know, 
how do we respond to the needs of citizens um, while at the same time trying to remain fiscally prudent and you know fiscally prudent doesn't mean austerity it shouldn't necessarily mean having to impose uh, massive cuts and, and huge tax increases on, on citizens and I think that's the last thing that we want uh, to do and it's certainly the last thing that other member states want to do but we have to make sure that we have a, a longer term plan that we don't just keep spending that we don't just keep borrowing that these flexibilities are not there indefinitely because there will come a point in time where we do have to try and uh, create some balance where we do have to make sure that we go back uh, and, and start working within the, the, the framework and the structures um, within the European Union um, you know so I think for now it's important that the support is provided. I think it's important that those flexibilities remain. I think it's important that there is solidarity. Uh, and again, that's why the 750 billion euro fund, I think, uh, is so significant, albeit you know, there are difference of views and opinions as to, to how much of that should be loans, how much of that should be grants. Um, but it's about rebooting our economy. It's about getting people back to work. Um, and you know, if that means maybe working outside of the parameters for a little bit longer than I, I think that's certainly something that we would advocate for but again you know we need to make sure that at the end of this we have a debt that's payable that's sustainable that that's uh, is workable and you know the longer these go on the more difficult that becomes and um, so you know it, I suppose timeline it's, it's very hard to see how but um, you know when we look at the repayment of, of the possible 750 billion euro we're talking about that being repaid from 2028 20, onwards over a period of 30 years it obviously raises questions as to how we will repay it the suggestions of new own resources which would raise concerns and questions for us uh, particularly around uh, digital tax around CCCTB or in carbon, carbon border adjustment uh, mechanisms, all of these things uh, are issues that have to be discussed further, that have to be uh, looked at in depth and, and you know we will do so with, with our colleagues and, and we will do so with other member states uh, in the weeks to come and months and years I think to come. Indeed, indeed. Uh, Patrick uh, Paul Walsh, who's a, an international development uh, specialist in UCD, more a comment, delighted to see the emphasis on SDGs and the Paris Agreement embedded in the recovery. He says it's important that there be a, an SDG implementation plan in place this year. So I think that's more of a comment. Uh, Adrian Pan. If I could just say that I suppose we, we had an implementation plan from 2018 to 2020, and as, as this was a whole of government approach looking at the implementation but supporting programs that would help further with the implementation so my understanding is that by the end of this year we will have a proposal for a new implementation plan which which would start later on next year okay good um the netherlands ambassador to ireland adrian palm makes a very interesting contribution suggests could the uh, country specific recommendations be looked on as a mechanism for conditionality with the new package of uh, possible loans and grants that have been that are being agreed at EU level. So this issue of some sort of conditionality could the CSRs be the basis for that some type of conditionality? So I think what's what's been suggested anyway at the moment is that the CSRs would be. Uh, somewhat linked and that there would have to be a report that each member state would have to fill in in terms of um, in terms of their overall need and requirements and how funding is being spent uh, so whether that's you know I, I know some member states and, and I've spoken to uh, to the ambassadors Europe minister only in the last week member states are looking for more stringent measures around conditionality as to how things uh, are spent there's obviously and had been before the COVID crisis proposals for uh, newer mechanisms to be put in place which would link spending with uh, the rule of law, which would link spending with certain other conditionalities. So I, I think there will have to be some mechanism and, and certainly I think the, the country specific recommendations would play a part um, in that, but to, to what level I don't know and in, in what detail I'm, I'm just not sure. Okay, um, one from Mike Allen, who's the Director of Advocacy at Focus Ireland. Uh, thanks you for your presentation. Uh, says that he was disappointed that housing and homelessness wasn't raised. Um, wondering what uh, the EU, how, let me quote, what more can the EU do to assist us solve our housing and homelessness problems? So I mean, look, at, at, as uh, I suppose, as, as listeners will know, it's it's a national competency in, in terms of how we respond to this crisis. And, you know, certainly we had a significant uh, and challenging time in the last 10 years 
with the economic crash, trying to respond to uh, the fact that I suppose the, the, the building uh, market collapsed. Um, there was no need for, for the houses that are now essentially, I suppose, that, that we are behind the curve and the investment wasn't um, there at the time when we needed it. We've put a huge amount of work in the last number of years um, through our, our, our government housing plan to try and um, get to the level where we are providing uh, the number of houses um, at the, the speed that it's needed. We've uh, built over 20,000 houses last year. We're on target again this year, I think, particularly when it comes to our social housing market. Uh, the objective is to build over 50,000 houses throughout the lifetime of the plan. And that's not just through new bills. Uh, if you include on top of that acquisitions and, and many other various different supports and assisted schemes, um, there's a lot of work underway, albeit I, I accept the progress has been slow, uh, maybe at the earlier stages of this program, but I really think we're starting to see progress. Of course, we don't know how COVID is going to impact on the overall market. Um, there are some suggestions that house prices might come down, but the cost of building will go up, uh, whether or not this, you know, the huge loss of uh, jobs, that the significant increase in unemployment numbers uh, could potentially, again, have a negative impact in that regard. So we need to make sure that, um, I suppose, no matter what we're doing, and particularly in a new programme for government, that this remains a key focus and a priority for us and, and just to ensure people that that is the case uh, that it's very much a part of the discussions and negotiations at a European level um, you know I, I know the recommendations do touch on this so I suppose it's, it's a matter of us taking these on board and doing everything that we can. Um, a, a final one Minister if I may the the industries that look uh, as if they'll be hit hardest by these, uh, by, by the pandemic, uh, hospitality, areas of transport. Many of these jobs are lower, lower paid, um, often lower skilled. Is there a risk, and you know, those with lower skills in lower pay sectors tend to have the most difficulty uh, getting into new jobs. Is, is there a concern um, around what can be done to help people uh, reskill and uh, find find alternative uh, employment if the jobs don't come back in in areas like hospitality. Well, I suppose there's two things there. Maybe uh, firstly, you're right in saying that you know uh, all sectors are impacted, but I would say in particular certain sectors are going to find it harder to uh, to get back to normal and for a lot of people to even reopen their doors. And um, we have this week um, we're going to announce a specific package for the hospitality sector, which will, I suppose, uh, try and provide additional funding supports, but other mechanisms to allow the sector to reopen and, and for people to get moving as things start to reopen, probably towards the end of this month into early July. Um, but we do know that there are certain jobs that won't be there. There are certain work that will need to be done. We have uh, the National Skills Strategy, which was established, which goes out to 2025. And a crucial part of that is that making sure that we have highly educated, highly skilled, but a highly adaptable workforce as well. Um, and as part of that, the Springboard Plus um, is, is key in terms of upskilling people, in terms of looking at, uh, again, an emphasis on digital skills, on, on workforces of the future. So people where, so where people, um, their jobs are, still, are, are not available or where there's you know, a need to readjust um, these type of programmes, this kind of mechanisms, uh, where there's a huge amount of funding being put in place to support them, will be absolutely vital for those sectors um, to allow people to reskill, to retrain, to, to, to adapt and to change to what's going to be a very changed environment um, as we come out of COVID. But you know, I suppose to say first and foremost, our objective and our goal is to make sure that we can support as many of those people as possible to get back to the sectors and industries that they've always worked in. And that is our first goal and objective. But secondly, where that's not possible, uh, definitely, as I said, that the, the, uh, the national skills strategy and, and many parts of that strategy, as I mentioned, one Springboard Plus, it will be absolutely vital in, in helping people to upskill, to reskill, to adjust, uh, and, and to, to, to adjust to the new environment that we find ourselves in. Good, Minister. I think with one minute left, rather than throw you another question, um, we'd be maybe more advisable to uh, let you get to your, your other meeting now. So, on behalf of the Institute and the Commission, who we're uh, co hosting the event with, uh, thank you for taking the time to join us and uh, for sharing those thoughts with us and answering, answering the questions. So uh, thanks again and have a good afternoon. Thanks a million, Dan. Thanks to everyone and good luck to all of the, the participants now over the next hour. Thank you. Thank you.
Good. Uh, so if I could bring in our other four participants, um, we'll kick off with Declan Costello in Brussels, who is going to give uh, a commission, obviously enough, perspective on the, um, on the CSRs. He is going to give a presentation uh, on that. Um, now bear with us on the technicals as this, uh, as this comes up. His presentation will come up on the screen if all goes to plan. Um, so, um, as I say, bear with me. Um, not quite seeing coming up yet. Um, there we are. I see Declan. Welcome, Declan. Now, do you? Do you? Are you going to take? You're going to take the screen. Uh, no, actually, could somebody manage it from there, please? Okay. Good. So colleagues will, uh, can we begin Declan's, um, thank you. Good. Okay, great. Um, so may I start? Um, I think we should get a bigger, yeah, that's it. I think we're ready to go. Declan, over to you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to thank the Institute for co-hosting this event uh, today with the European Commission. Um, so what I would like to do today, if I go to the next slide, um, I'd like to do two things. First, I would like to explain to you how the Commission has responded to the economic impact of the coronavirus, and more specifically, how we've adapted the European semester process to what is you know, a dramatic uh, turn of economic events. And then secondly, I'd like to spell out uh, the, the, the recommendations which have now been addressed to Ireland. So if we can go to the next slide. And again, so obviously uh, what's driving the whole process, of course, is the, is, is, is the huge economic impact of the pandemic. Um, in our forecasts, which was published in early May, we projected that real GDP in Ireland would fall by almost 8% uh, this year. There would be uh, a rebound in the course of 2021, but it, was, it would only be a partial recovery of the lost, of the lost growth. Um, now, the, the impact which we project on GDP in Ireland is actually very, very similar to what we expect for the euro area as a whole, okay? But maybe, it's, obviously, there's a huge amount of uncertainty, and what we see is a large number of downside risks. Now, when we, what, the, 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 the minus 8% figure is our baseline forecast, um, but we did run some additional scenarios in the event of the containment measures lasting longer than we had initially foreseen. And in that longer lasting scenario, uh, we project growth could be somewhere in the region of minus 10, minus 11. And in the event of a second wave of the pandemic spreading, we project that growth could actually be almost minus, somewhere between minus 15 and minus 16%. Now, since we published that forecast in May, it does seem that some of the containment measures are being withdrawn more progressively than we had initially assumed. So I think the possibility is that, uh, you know, when we, when we come to revise our forecast, we will probably be leaning towards this longer lasting scenario right now compared to our baseline. Okay. Um, if I can turn to the next slide. So clearly the challenge which we faced was to make the, Euro the European semester process relevant for the, the economic challenges facing, facing our member states. Um, now typically, as you know, we've tended to try, we've tried to focus in on uh, longer lasting structural challenges which affect uh, growth and employment over the longer term. Um, but here, given the immediacy of the crisis, we, we've, had to, we've had to react quickly. Now we've done this in, in several ways. Um, first, we have adapted our recommendations on fiscal policy to reflect the fact that the general escape clause of the Stability and Growth Pact has been activated. I'll say more about that in a minute. Secondly, we've tried to come up with uh, broad indications for all member states, given that this is a symmetric economic block, in five areas which could help, which we hope will help guide countries as they start to design policies with, to, to bring about a recovery process. Now, these include recommendations in the area of public health, employment policy, how to support business, especially SMEs through the crisis, um, how to provide liquidity support to corporates to, to enable them to survive, and also recommendations to ensure the, the, the smooth functioning of the single market. So these are specific new types of, new types of recommendations, 
specifically geared at, 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 at addressing, let's say, the immediate challenges in front of us. At the same time, we do want to keep a, a forward-looking bridge to the sort of key structural challenges which our countries face, and in particular, which you know, may move forward or keep, you know, in, in, you know, as we put in place recovery plans, to make sure that they work towards the longer term objectives of the union in terms of the green and digital transition in particular. And so that's why the recommendations this year look, 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 look different compared to what we had in previous years. If I can turn to the next slide. <coughs> next slide. Okay. And I actually go to the next slide again. Okay. Now, in addition to, you know, providing policy guidance to member states in terms of, you know, how we might collectively have a coordinated response to the pandemic, it's also been very evident that there was a need for EU level support. Okay. And a huge uh, set of measures have now been, uh, some have been agreed and some have been pro proposed which hopefully will provide you know, a, a fiscal stimulus to our countries to help us get through this very difficult period. Now, the first set of proposals are already agreed and are operational or are very, very close to being operational. So we have now a uh, unemployment insurance scheme, SURE, which member states can apply for funding or can, can make requests up to 100 billion euros in total um, in, in the form of a uh, loan, concessional loans, and these can be used to support short-term working schemes to help keep and protect people in their jobs to the extent that that is possible. Um, this is agreed. Uh, it should be uh, operational by the, hopefully by the end of, of June and, and worth 100 billion euros. The second element which has been agreed is the post, what's called pandemic crisis support. And again, this is, allows for the possibility for member states to request funding up to 2% of GDP uh, from the ESM, again, at very concessional terms over the long term. And then finally, uh, a guarantee fund of 25 billion has been provided to the EIB, which in turn should allow them to provide financial support to companies. And the bulk of this is supposed to be, supposed to be oriented towards uh, uh, small and medium-sized enterprises. So this, one, this 540 billion in total is agreed and should be, if not operational today, should be operational in the next couple of weeks. We then, and this was the proposal of the Commission some, uh, some days ago, the Commission came forward with a revised proposal for the, uh, the next multi-annual financial framework for the period 2000, uh, uh, 2021 to 2027. Uh, it's similar, but slightly larger than the, the last proposal which was being discussed uh, at the beginning of this year. But on top of that, the Commission has proposed next generation EU. So this is a 750 billion euro supplement to the MFF, 500 billion in the form of grants, 250 billion in the form of loans. This would be sort of a one-off injection of, uh, of, of funds, which our member states could draw upon. Um, uh, the idea would be that these funds should be dispersed and used ideally between 2021 and 2024. So precisely the moment when we need to sort of kickstart the recovery in, in our economy. Now, I'd like to say a couple of words about this next generation EU because it will play a critical role in shaping and guiding how the European semester goes forward. If I could go to the next slide. Okay, essentially what, it's, what, what the Commission has proposed for this 750 billion euros is to break it down into three groups of funding, okay? The bulk of the funding Will go in, will be under the first pillar, which is to support the recovery at member state level. Okay. Um, the bulk of that funding, 560 billion euros, 310 of which would be in grants, would, would operate through a new recovery and resilience facility. Okay. So the idea is that member states, they have up to two years, but we expect these discussions to start very quickly, submit to the Commission plans and proposals for investments and reforms, which should, I say, be front-loaded, ideally undertaken in, in the period up to 2024. Um, the Commission would assess those plans, and there would be a very, very heavy emphasis on, on projects that uh, support the, deep, the green and digital transition. Um, these recovery and resilience plans should be annexed to the national reform programs which member states submit to the Commission in April every year. And on that basis, 
And looking at the plans, a series of, uh, of disbursements can be arranged subject to uh, key indicators and targets being, 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 being uh, achieved. So, as I said, all of this is, of course, it's still only a commission proposal. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done in negotiating on it. One of the key issues, of course, is going to be the governance of this and the link to the European semesters and what role the country-specific recommendations will, will, will make. But it is clear that this will introduce a, you know, a big change in the dynamic of the European semester because we will not only be discussing types of reforms which member states could, you know, which, which, which we recommend or, or consider should be done, it actually means that there will be financial resources to back up the implementation of many of these key reforms. Second pillar is more to help the private sector, uh, private sector start. Now here, uh, there's a number of facilities which are being envisaged. Perhaps the most innovative one is a solvency support instrument. And so this is what the idea here is that guarantees would be provided from the EU budget to the EIB group, who in turn, through a series of financial intermediaries, could provide equity support or equity type support for companies uh, in the EU uh, wh whose balance sheets have been damaged. And the idea here would be to, 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 you know, to, to, to enable you know, potentially viable companies to remain solvent and, and, and thrive in, you know, over the long term. And then finally, uh, a third group of projects, uh, the, the third pillar of support from the, you know, of the 750 billion, this will go into uh, reinforced uh, healthcare programs, also some reinforcement of the budgets for external support. Okay, thank you. If you could move to the next slide. Okay, and again, I, I think I've covered it. All right, and again, we move on. So, in a sense, what the commission, so just to, to wrap up, we, the, so what, what, what we're facing for the semester is you know, the need to come up with recommendations which help member states put in place the policies for the recovery. Um, but we are also going to have to think about that, these, that this should eventually evolve into recovery plans, which should help member states draw upon this recovery, new recovery and resilience fund. So if I can turn to the specific recommendations which were addressed to Ireland, we can go to the next slide. So the first recommendation uh, concerns the uh, on fiscal policy. Now here it's, it's, uh, it's very different to previous years because the Stability and Growth Pact uh, has the, the general escape clause of the Stability and Growth Pact has been activated. Now that does not mean that the fiscal rules have been suspended. What it means is that member states no longer have the obligation at the current economic juncture to, to, to take policies which to achieve a, a balanced budget position over the economic cycle or to make the transition towards that. Okay? So it makes clear that you know, the member, we, we call upon member states to take necessary fiscal measures to support the economy and the recovery process. Okay? And in due course, uh, uh, this of course needs to be consistent over time with debt sustainability and sound positions. Now many, we're, we're, the Commission is getting very many questions on what does this mean in terms of when will the general escape clause be revoked? When will member states have to return to paths of fiscal consolidation? Right now, there is so much uncertainty about the impact and trajectory of the, of the pandemic and its economic impact. We're simply not in a position to be able to, we, don't, we simply feel it's too uncertain to be able to give guidance to member states on, 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 on let's say, medium, medium to longer term trajectories to restore debt sustainability. So this is an issue which eventually we will have to come back to. But right now, the, 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 the message is that member states should use fiscal policy to support the economic recovery process. If I can go to the next slide. Our second, uh, so we, have, we then also have a, a, a CSR related to the healthcare system. Now, I'm not an expert on the Irish healthcare system. I'm sure there's many more qualified people than, than I am in the, in the audience. Um, but it's clear that the COVID crisis did cast the light on many of the structural shortcomings and challenges facing the Irish healthcare system. Um, and clearly now, it's, 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 we hope that uh, you know, as part of the recovery process, it will be important that these structural challenges are, 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 are addressed. Now, the, the, the CSR and, and the accompanying country, country report does identify areas which we think there is, there, there is the, where the direction, policy direction could, could, could go forward. One is obviously we see that it would be helpful if you know, the, the, the implementation of care, uh, you know needs to be accelerated, in particular the move to establish universal coverage for primary health care. 
Um, we also see scope to improve the IT systems uh, in the, uh, the use of IT and, uh, within the healthcare system in Ireland. I think it's been very evident in Ireland, but in many countries, about the possibility to have remote access to, 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 to healthcare. And then finally, a particular issue in Ireland concerns uh, the, the health workers. Um, now, this is not just a question of the actual numbers of health professionals in the system, but there does seem to be particular issues around recruitment and, and retention of staff and staff in particular areas. If I could turn to the next slide. So there's a heavy focus, as I mentioned at the beginning, on the, on the social um, uh, impact uh, of, of the economic crisis. And here, uh, the, the, the recommendation here talks, you know, the importance about developing skills, particularly about tackling the, the, the digital divide uh, in the education sector. Um, now, so again, I think here we do see that, you know, Ireland has some strengths when it comes to, 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 to uh, uh, skills in the IT sector. But we also see that actually, you know, the, the, the level of um, uh, digital skills, in a sense, in the general public, is not as is not as is, is not as is not as uh, advanced as it would be in, in, compared to the EU average. A further issue, which is drawn attention to, of course, in, in the uh, in, in the uh, CSR, concerns the need to increase the provision of social and affordable housing. Now, the country report does recognise that considerable progress has been made here, but it would seem to be an area where there is scope for continued investment, and certainly it could also help in terms of uh, employment going forward. If we could turn to the next slide. Now here, uh, this slide, there's a, there's a recommendation. This is about the immediate measures which have been put in place to provide liquidity support for households and for businesses. Uh, we think that on the, on the whole, not only in Ireland, but across Europe, many of the governments have in general reacted quite quickly. And um, nonetheless, we call upon countries to you know, do their best to ensure that these are, 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 are well targeted and also that they remain in place for as long as, as, as is necessary. If I could go to the next slide. Now the next slide is possibly one, I think this recommendation on public investment, this is actually probably the recommendation which is the most useful and the most interesting when it comes to thinking about the recovery and the resilience plan going forward for Ireland, because it identifies key areas where the commission believes not only the Commission, but the Council believe that there is scope to increase public investment, and this could be sort of the backbone of, of, of the recovery and resilience plan. I'll just go through to some of these in, 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 I'll mention some of these in detail. If I can go to the next slide. So the first we can see, we, there's a focus on uh, investment in the green transition. Um, so we do see that Ireland has been lagging behind when it comes to decarbonisation. Um, the Climate Action Plan is, however, credible and ambitious. But now there's a need to take it to the next level to finalize and submit the National Energy uh, Climate Plan. Uh, climate plan. Um, and so this, I think, should actually possibly be you know, one of the core elements of, of the resilience plan going forward. Maybe something important to note, um, the Just Transition Fund, the Commission, as part of this 750 billion euros, has proposed a significant increase in the financial provisions for the Just Transition Fund. So there may be scope to, for, 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 for Ireland to, 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 go be, to look beyond what is already what is considered at the beginning of the year. If we can go to the next slide. We should, okay, here there's also a mention of the reference on, on water supply and treatment. Well, this refers to the very high leakage rate in the, in the, in the waste supply system, oh, sorry, the water supply system of Ireland. Uh, it's also, of course, there's a, you know, a general problem in Ireland in terms of waste water, particularly in the large urban areas. Um, and the, this you know, has led to consistent problems of compliance with the waste the wastewater treatment uh, directive. So again, waste so water supply and treatment I think could be a priority. As indeed, if you see on the next slide, we suggest we suggest you know a continued focus on uh, investment in clean public transport. And um, there are some very ambitious plans when it comes to the electrification uh, of, 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 the, of the railway sector, the transition to, to electric vehicles. But of course, these now might need to be backed up with, with, with individual policies. If I can go forward to the next slide. Okay, here uh, the focus, uh, the recommendation also recommends a, a you know, continued focus on, on R and D. Uh, there, there are some issues. Uh, you know, Ireland is a, you know, in aggregate is not is, is certainly not the weakest performer in the EU, but we do see some issues about the level of funding, which is unlikely to uh, 
be sufficient to reach the, the common goal of 2.5% of GMP by 2030. Um, so further efforts could be undertaken in this regard. And indeed, there is possibly a need to look at the actual structure of public support being provided to, uh, to, 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 to or for R&D to the business sector, given the very, very heavy focus on tax credits, which, which tends, to focus, uh, tends to benefit most of the larger companies. If I can turn to two more slides. Actually, I've already think covered the digital transition, if we can go. Okay, and uh, again, now here, uh, last two slides, um, you know, the commission did decide in this package of CSRs to put quite a bit of attention on the issue of um, anti-money laundering and on the issue of um, uh, tax um, uh, dealing with aggressive tax compliance. Um, and the reason for that is one, we, we do see, I mean, obviously tax fairness is, what is, a, is a key issue. And obviously given the impact of COVID on our public finances, um, the need to have efficient, fair, and effective tax collection systems will be, uh, will be important. Now the country report does recognize in both of these areas, uh, aggressive tax planning and anti-money laundering, that Ireland has, had, you know, has made progress in these areas. But if you take anti-money laundering, there is an inherent risk given the structure of the Irish economy uh, for, 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 for anti-money laundering. Um, now we do see that, uh, you know, for example, here there's a, when it comes to sort of servicing companies, um, when it comes to sort of the, the, the servicing companies, uh, we do see risks in terms of um, the fact that uh, the number of, tr of transactions which uh, are, are reported by professionals are being, uh, as being suspicious is relatively low. Um, and therefore we have some concerns not so much with the institutional framework, but with the actual rollout and implementation of policy in these areas. And that's why we are calling upon the Irish government to, to do more. Dan, I'll stop here. Sorry if I've gone on a bit too long, but there's a lot of ground to cover. Thank you. Good. Um, thanks, Declan. Was very much taken by the slide showing that Ireland's population is a lower than average uh, level of basic digital skills. Uh, but we might pick that one up later in the in the uh, in the discussion and uh, what quite why that will be the case given that we're the, one of the youngest populations if not the youngest population in a, in a big tech sector so I'd be particularly interested to, to look at that but just one issue that you raised you mentioned the, the symmetrical nature of this shock uh, I know that was the feeling at the beginning, but as things have gone on the, the, the economic data is showing a bit of a divergence between the north and the south that the the, the Nordic countries seem to be doing, not as bad as the southern European countries. Are you seeing anything like that opening up in terms of economic performance in the pandemic period, in the pandemic era? You, yeah. Yeah. No. We. 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 we indeed, the the, you know, the 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 proximate cause of the shock indeed was symmetric. However, if we if we look at our uh, economic forecasts, what we we see is that the, the projected impact on GDP this year and next year is asymmetric. Um, which in part depends, uh, or uh, quite a lot of this seems to depend upon the structure of the economy. So those economies which are heavily exposed or heavily reliant to some service sectors or the tourism sector, um, they will be impacted uh, uh, considerably more than countries which maybe rely more and more like Germany on manufacturing, where the expected rebound is, 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 is anticipated to be higher at least. But in addition to the differences in terms of economic impact, what we're also seeing is differences in the policy response by member states. And for many countries, the, the types of policies which countries are introducing are very, very similar in terms of liquidity support for households and firms. Um, but what we're seeing is that there's no real correlation between the economic impact of COVID and the actual size of the fiscal supports which are given. And it's, 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 it's very differential and, and clearly the capacity of countries of countries with, with low economic, you know, um, with lower GDP, but particularly with uh, lower fiscal space, countries with high level, which, which enter the crisis with higher levels of debt and deficits and debt, they have in general not been able to provide as big fiscal supports as other countries. And that poses quite a lot of risks. It poses risks of growing economic divergence within the it poses risks in terms of um, the functioning of the single market. Um, so for example, to date, 
over, I think, about 50% of all of the requests for approval under the temporary state aid framework have come from Germany. Now, don't get me wrong, we're very, very supportive of what uh, the German government is doing to support its enterprises, but the capacity, the fact that other countries are, are in a weaker position to do so, makes us concerned about how this will play out for the, the level playing field. I guess going forward, we would also be concerned if, if those countries which are in a weaker economic position to begin with, if, you know, if, they, if they cannot then make the necessary investments when it comes to the green and digital transition, what you could have is a very uneven approach to tackling climate change and, and, the, digital, and the digital transition. Thank you. Okay, thanks, uh, Declan. Good. So uh, let's go to our three panelists representing uh, trade unions, business, and um, academia, academia think tank. Uh, we'll start with Patricia King, who's the Second General of the Irish Congress of Trade Unions. Pat Patricia, over to you. Thank you very much, Chair, and on behalf of the Congress of Trade Unions, which represents over 700,000 uh, uh, trade union members across the island, um, I welcome the opportunity to set out our response to the European Commission's draft country-specific recommendations. And I particularly welcome uh, the theme of today's discussion is a sustainable and fair economy for Ireland and for Europe. I think it reflects in part the ongoing reassessment of many things that have been taking place over the recent weeks of public services, of essential workers, and of our whole sense of solidarity. So, as we are all acutely aware, uh, this year's CSRs have been presented against the backdrop of an unprecedented uh, disruption that COVID-19 has caused to societies and economies across the world, and not least here in Ireland, where tragically uh, close to 1,700 people have died so far, and over 25,000 people have been infected, nearly one third of whom are health uh, healthcare workers. And all our worlds changed when the seriousness and consequences of the news emerging from China from early this year slowly began to dawn on us. And the economic and social situation and the challenges outlined in the 2020 country report published in late February were totally upended within days uh, of the introduction of the necessary restrictions to protect public health in March. So ICTU acknowledges that the EU's response to COVID-19, including as set out uh, in the European Commission CSRs, takes account of some of the lessons learned from it. But frankly, disastrous response to the 2008 financial crisis from the point of view of workers, at least, um, at least it is not that uh, response that we are seeing albeit as the minister made reference to they have been somewhat late to the pass in terms of solutions uh, for one we very much agreed with the decision to activate the general escape clause of the stability and growth pact in response to the economic downturn and we now welcome specific calls in the csrs to ireland to take all the necessary measures to address the pandemic, out, um, address the consequences and sustain the economy and support ensuring a recovery. Also to promote investment, particularly on the green and digital transition and to improve the health system as Declan has gone into in great detail and ensure universal primary care cover uh, to increase the provision of social and affordable housing to develop our skills and address the digital divide and to broaden the tax base and tackle aggressive uh, tax planning. But these particular recommendations address many of the issues that we and others have been raising over many years, but which hadn't been adequately addressed as the February's general election results probably uh, clearly showed. But we equally believe that what's not in the uh, CSRs indicate that there is still some way to go uh, before we can truly say that we're on the road to a sustainable and fair recovery. In the limited time available, I will just focus on one area, which is the area of social dialogue and the ability of workers to collectively bargain the value of their labor. And participants will recall that last year's commission's country report criticized the fact that social dialogue in Ireland was mostly consultative and that the social partners were rarely involved and consultative in relation to the European semester process by the government. I regret to say that from our perspective, at least, not only has this situation not improved, but has actually, in our opinion, deteriorated compared to developments in some other countries over the past year. And not all of it 
has been down to COVID-19. Furthermore, we were given less than time this year uh, to respond a little over one day to comment on the national reform program, a draft that didn't even address the implications of COVID-19. So disappointingly, we see little or no evidence of our comments being taken into account in the national uh, uh, reform program, other than being summarized in an appendix. Um, this one is unfortunate, but it is also factual. ICTU very much welcomed the proclamation of the European Pillar of Social Rights in 2017. We particularly welcomed Principle 8, which includes the statement that employers and unions shall be encouraged to negotiate and conclude collective agreements in matters relevant to them, while respecting their autonomy and the right to collective action. And we saw this principle reflected in the Commission's draft Council recommendation of December 2019 on the economic policy of the Euro area. And this included the explicit recommendation that Euro area member states take action individually and collectively to enhance the effectiveness of social dialogue and promote uh, collective bargaining. This recommendation was approved by the ECOFIN Council on the 18th of February with the Minister for Finance and Public and for Public uh, for Finance and Public Expenditure representing Ireland. And we acknowledge the statement in this year's CSRs to the effect that in cooperation with the social partners, the current context calls to continue upskilling and reskilling efforts in order to meet the changing needs of the labour market and prepare the workforce for the climate, energy and circular economy transition. But we're disappointed that the Commission did not explicitly reiterate its broader recommendations to enhance the effectiveness of social dialogue. And we should be deeply concerned if this reflects a more general turning away of its commitment to the pillar of social rights. Um, enhancing the effectiveness of social dialogue and promoting uh, collective bargaining agreements is not just about respecting fundamental rights. It is now more than ever an economic imperative. Social dialogue and collective bargaining are in fact the way to minimize and overcome the economic fallout of COVID-19. Research by the OECD shows that countries with inclusive collective bargaining systems such as Austria, Denmark, Finland, Germany, and the Netherlands, and Sweden, are, where up to 90% of private sector workers are covered by such collective agreements are associated with much better labor market outcomes than in Ireland in terms of higher employment, lower unemployment rates, particularly for young workers, women, and the low skilled, but also greater wage equality and higher productivity. So in short, social dialogue and workers' ability to collectively bargain in their workplaces, in our opinion, is vital. Workers, worker voices must be heard, and it is crucially that once and for all, we deal with the issues of low pay and precarious work practices in this country. Only in this way can we ensure a sustainable and fair recovery for all. And if the EU, EU and the incoming government does not uh, promote this approach, it risks undermining the social cohesion and stability that currently exists, but that will no doubt be under severe strain in the years ahead. ahead. Uh, COVID-19 has shown us that the old ways of doing things um, were totally unsuitable in, when faced with a major crisis. It taught us also uh, who our essential workers are and the fact that they are often undervalued and underpaid. It taught us recently actually that we had to reduce the income of laid off workers to create an incentive to work. And it taught us the necessity to reform our social security system and deal with this issue of low pay. And indeed, as has been rightly reflected in the CSRs, deal with uh, the issues regarding our health system, solving our housing crisis and creating a just transition. So it has shown us that it's possible to do things that were previously considered impossible. In my opinion, the leadership challenge for us all is to build a labour market which is more participative, sustainable and fairer, to build a buoyant economy and a much less fractured society within a social Europe. And for trade unions and workers, our view is there can be no going back, but I believe that we are ready to meet these challenges. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, uh, Patricia. And maybe we'll go straight over to the other big uh, social partner in the shape of 
uh, Ibeck, whose CEO, uh, Danny McCoy, is uh, going to give the next contribution. Thanks, Danny. Uh, thank you very much, Dan. And I suppose uh, to get the social di dialogue going, I agree with most of what Patricia said, um, which may be a surprise um, to people, is that we're right. We, we have seen in this crisis that we need to actually have a social model reflective of the economy as it is, not like how it used to be. And I guess some of the things coming through from the CS or from the European Commission, I think are reflective of that. Uh, you raise one of those issues yourself, Dan, about surprise around the digital divide that exists in our uh, society, which probably we haven't fully seen the uh, reverberations of that just yet, but we certainly have some indication during the COVID crisis about the differential access to education and ultimately to training, which will have emerged during this uh, quarter because of those digital um, divides that we have in our economy. And also the fact that we need to uh, look at the Irish economy, as I said, as it is, which is now primarily driven uh, by services, but also services embodied in the manufacturing process as well. So a lot of the divides about what were essential services um, and indeed essential workers, I think will also need to be uh, analyzed as a result of this shock. So for me, the, um, the, the main issues I'd like to just address from uh, the country specific recommendations, I think uh, are reflective, probably encapsulated by the uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, I think that collectively we should uh, rally around those um, sustainable development goals now to look to see how we can build a more, more than just a consultative process. Um, and I think that's where social dialogue and this new form of social dialogue, I think has many advantages to us. As, as Patricia said, we um, as actors in that have certainly seen the benefits of reacting quickly Tragically, some of the things that we had to react quickly on should have been in place uh, going into this crisis because we had been planning for another event, which is still with us, which is Brexit. And so the temporary wage subsidy scheme, thankfully today, we see it is now exceeding the numbers on the uh, COP. Um, but that should have been the case right from the start. If we had a, a wage subsidy scheme in place for these critical events, then we would have been able to keep people more attached to their employers and have um, an easier way of getting out of this. So the social dialogue um, aspects that were in the previous ones, I think, are critical. And that's something that the business community has been calling for over the last number of years. You see this in a global context, this view of moving away from shareholder exclusive value to stakeholder may sound nice in the Harvard Business Review, but the reality of it is it involves um, engagement, uh, working and participating with NGOs and trade unions uh, in a context where there needs to be an allocation of resources. And so for, for Ireland, which I think is kind of absent, perhaps understandably, is that we don't have the luxury of a defined European Union and space. We share now uh, an island with a non-EU member state, and that's going to be quite an interesting a part of social dialogue as well. Uh, Patricia indicated at the start the all-island dimension of ICTU. Uh, IBEC is also jointly with the Confederation of British Industry, has a joint business council on the all-island. And one of the features that we'll see is that the labor market responses in which um, we've, we find that our interaction with, with ICTU and IBEC has been on the Labor Employer Economic Forum, that this has raised issues not about centralized wage bargaining nor industrial disputes, the two planks of social partnership for those who want to uh, be comforted that we're not looking for a social partnership uh, model as before, but one that's actually now reflective of the future, is that the labor market issues that we've been dealing with involve retirement age, something that'll be a big uh, issue in the program for government, I'm sure, but it also involves childcare, it involves the infrastructure, the transportation system. So all of these issues actually require allocation of resources to which our model has failed over the last number of years to address, even at the time of plenty. So the dialogue really needs to, as I said at the start, really needs to reflect the Ireland as it is now. And I'm not sure that really comes out 
actually in the European uh, Commission's assessment. I see very little of reflecting the fact of the intangible assets that have actually been driving the economy. But where we find such nonsense as a GNI star, which was a knee jerk reaction to 2015. In fact, without COVID, uh, I would suggest that 2020 was shaping up to be a GDP year equivalent of 2015. And I think you see that uh, in the uh, national accounts coming through, but also in our exchequer returns in the last number of days. So I'm not certain that the uh, assessment of where we're at at the moment is actually specifically uh, focused on the Ireland as it is right now. And I would encourage all of us, all of the actors are on this call, including uh, those who are listening to it, that we do need a social dialogue that's wider than just IBEC and ICTU clearly, but on the issues of the labour market in particular and how that uh, will be a medium for some of the issues of getting people back to work and to try to get the digital divide and the skills uh, mediated through there. I think the program for government, with the support of everybody that's actually on the call, um, needs to see a new form of social dialogue. And that involves things like widening the tax base, which is a new commission of taxation. But last point, also on the social welfare. It may not be centralized wage bargaining, but it's clear to anybody that we now need to have a mediation of resources uh, through the labor market proposition and that the PRSI system, the social insurance system, is one of those mechanisms because people aren't just precarious with low pay anymore. People now with high pay realize that events like COVID means that anybody is potentially precarious and they found that the social welfare system that we had here was not fit for purpose. Good. Uh, thank you, Danny. So Patricia, Danny, I'm going to go to Alan now, but a question you, you both highlighted uh, social dialogue and, and there seems to be quite a lot of agreement uh, between you on that. Maybe when we come back, some questions. Could you just make one or two points about how the social dialogue that you envisage going forward would differ from the pre-2008 social dialogue? I'd just be interested to get, get both your views on, on what, what might be different and particularly what might be better in the social dialogue that you foresee for the future than the one we had pre-2008. So maybe one to mull while Alan is giving his presentation. Alan, you're going to uh, give a PowerPoint. You're going to yeah. take up the screen now. So I hand the whole lot over to you and look forward to your presentation. Thanks, Alan. Okay, so let me uh, share my screen. Is that working? That's good. Okay, so I'll move through this uh, relatively quickly because I know people are going to want to get uh, to some questions. Uh, but let me start off with a sort of a, a big theme uh, in a sense. And I suppose one of the things that the, the crisis has done, uh, it's that it has generated a lot of, of reflection. I suppose it's one of these sort of dramatic moments in history where we've kind of been shaken uh, to the core. And um, I, I've been sort of part of this reflection. And uh, one, of, one of the things that has done is sort of prompted me to, to think again about sort of e economics and economic policy and to just to, to think about uh, this document on the uh, country specific recommendations along these sort of lines. So I think we just to reflect very briefly, market economies, I think we increasingly recognize are very good at generating wealth. Uh, at least if the state is providing certain inputs, which are pretty critical. There's infrastructure, uh, regulation, and public services are some of the things that I've, I've listed there. Uh, and then market economies are really bad uh, at doing certain other things. For example, they're really bad at redistribution. Uh, they're really bad at providing security. Uh, there I'm talking about things like income uh, security, housing. And they're really, really bad uh, at uh, providing environmental protection. So I think when I read documents now, such as the, uh, the CSRs, that's the sort of framework I'm thinking. So where is policy sort of pushing with the economy in the, ten, in the market economy in terms of doing things well? And where does it need to be sort of, again, pushing against uh, where the economy is doing things rather badly? Uh, and that's, in a sense, the way I'm going to structure uh, the comments. I should say, it was kind of funny at the outset, but uh, Danny and Patricia seem to be agreeing with uh, one another. I think I'm going to be agreeing as well. So I wonder, are we on the threshold of another group thing disaster in Ireland? But we can, uh, we can address that when we come to the questions. Okay, so on that issue then of sort of the, the, what the econo market economy does well and, and, and where we need to be pushing with it, I think the most relevant recommendation uh, in the CSOR is uh, recommendation three, I mean, this is part of it, and this is the notion of continuing to provide uh, support to companies, notably small and medium-sized enterprises, 
uh, especially through uh, liquidity. And this, of course, is what the government uh, have essentially been doing uh, to, to a certain extent, and, and we know they should, they should be doing it. But if I could just add an, another dimension, um, I think we can be sort of caught up very much with the immediate need, but let's not lose sight of the broader policy considerations that have been floating around for quite a while. And I think in the, in the Irish situation, and again, the, the CSR document makes reference to this, uh, the big challenge, of course, for SMEs has been the productivity gap uh, between uh, our you know, foreign and domestic sectors. So I guess most what I would be saying is, is that, yes, let's uh, provide the support, but let's do it in such a way that's consistent with some of the policy issues that we've previously identified. Now, just if I can make a small, quick reference to, to ESRI work on this, so I think one of the things, one of the nice things about being director of the SRI, I don't get to do an awful lot of research anymore, but I get to read a lot of research by other people. And from sort of different teams within the ESRI, some of the things that have been coming across, I mean, firstly, that SMEs, we have a high skill base in Ireland, but it seems in our, in our SMEs that skill base does not be used uh, terribly effectively. So we have a, a high rate of, of overskilled employees. We have low rates of investment within our SMEs. Uh, and we've low levels of connectivity uh, between our uh, foreign multinationals. So let me just sort of say that, yes, let's provide the supports, but let's provide the supports in a sort of a targeted and a very intelligent way. Uh, and I, I, I put the, the sort of the, the challenge at the, the last point there in the slide. This is the ongoing challenge for industrial policy. This is always there and it probably always will be there. How do you support the firms of the future by allowing non-viable firms to pass away? I still think we need to keep that in mind, uh, you know, even in a context where we're, we're trying to be charitable uh, to, towards businesses that are under pressure. Now, let me come to the second point I, I mentioned at the outset, this note, uh, redistribution and providing uh, security. Now, I'm going to discuss recommendation two in that sort of the context. I could have chosen to discuss it in, in terms of uh, the more um, working with the economy, but, but let me deal with it here. So, recommendation two makes reference to things like support employment through developing skills, address the risk of the digital divide, including in the education sector, and increase the provision of social and affordable housing. So again, some of the, the themes that have been mentioned by uh, Patricia and, and Danny. Now, just a, a point here that I, that I want to stress. So ESRI research, this is our, our tax and welfare research, uh, has contributed to demonstrating this fact that the Irish welfare and tax system works really well at combating inequality. So again, a lot of you will have seen the, the CSRI work, uh, that when you do this analysis, you see that Ireland moves from one of the more unequal OECD countries uh, into the, the middle range, and that we have this system that, that works very, very well. Okay, that's true, but there's a couple of points that I, I just want to add, again, from ESRI research that I, that I think are, are relevant. So the, the work I just talked about looks at, at households in a point of time, but there's many other dimensions to equality, and I think the crisis has given rise to some of these. So the first is the issue of inequality over time. Okay, and this is the question about, like, you know, if, if you're born in Ireland in, a, in a, uh, an unfavorable socioeconomic uh, situation, what are the possibilities that, that you will move out of that over time? So in the sense that you'll move up the income distribution over time. Do we have a society that facilitates that? I have to say, in the institute, we run the Growing Up in Ireland survey, which looks at the situations of kids. Uh, and one of the most depressing and striking things is that as you, you know, the re results of this come true and true, you just sort of see disadvantage beginning early in life and then ac accumulating. Uh, and then there's, as I said, there are other dimensions of uh, inequality, and gender is just one that I'll talk about. The relevance of all this to the crisis, it's highly likely that the crisis has widened educational inequalities. I think we all have a sense of this, uh, that homeschooling would have worked very well in some families and disastrously in others. It's gone on for a period of time now, so there's a possibility that we're just you know, watching those sort of socioeconomic uh, gaps widening as we speak. Inequalities in employment prospects. Again, we've known for recessions for many, many years that lower skilled folks are more likely to lose their jobs. Uh, and of course, once you lose your job, the fear of you becoming long-term unemployed becomes, becomes really acute. Uh, and then the gender uh, inequalities. There's, again, buckets of evidence now coming from all over the world uh, that at, at one level, women have been uh, more likely to lose jobs because of the nature of a lot of jobs. But for even for women in, in, in the home, this horrible ongoing reality uh, that, that work on, on the home front and in caring has, has been sort of, you know, has a gendered dimension in it, uh, there's no doubt that the crisis has been tougher on women. 
policy, the sort of sort of skills development, the digital divide, the sort of things said in the the, uh, the the recommendation. All of these are really really critical, and we really need to think creatively about how we're going to uh, to deal with it. I just mentioned something very very briefly on on healthcare. Um, one of the things that has come out of the crisis, this sort of sense that technology and digitalization has moved on, and in the healthcare area, there is this sort of sense that, well, one of the things we can do is we can make healthcare delivery more uh, productive, more efficient, if we move to uh, a more digitally based uh, inter intervention. That could well be the case, it's just the one thing we don't know is whether or not that would be different uh, for, for patient outcomes uh, on aggregate or across different votes. Coming to the last couple of, of slides now, okay, so environmental protection, like I mentioned that, another area where the, where the market is really terrible, and the uh, CSRs in, include references to the possible uh, green in investments. So let me just say, if there is going to be a stimulus package, let it be green. And uh, I know Declan mentioned the fiscal rules earlier on, but let me say, I think one possible advantage here is with, let me just sort of say, the suspension of the fiscal rules, there is a possibility that I think we can get much more rational uh, investment strategies uh, in the sense that the state can actually go out and borrow and, and invest uh, without constraints of the fiscal rules and, and really make pr uh, progress in, in terms of uh, green projects. Okay, so my concluding slide then. So I said at the outset that the crisis has generated reflection on the goals of economic and social policy, which is true. Uh, but I could have also said that it has is, it is generated reflection on the role of the state. Everything I think that has happened has suggested that the, the role of the state might, might have to be bigger. Uh, and there is a relevance here where the, the Commission have a, in about broadening the tax base. But last point, if the role of the state needs to be bigger in our economy and our society, uh, taxes will have to go up. Uh, I think if we're having that debate at some stage, I sincerely hope we can have that debate about tax and that it's not confused in some sense with austerity. Uh, I have a point there, adjustment to the new normal could be bigger state and a bigger tax burden. So with that, I'll leave it down. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll just ask you uh, a follow-up in terms of what you, um, the government's response to support, and I know this is different in member states, um, do you, there are big risks, obviously, to the taxpayer uh, giving uh, excessive support to private companies. Do you have a view on what's happened to date I mean, I, I think to date the the approach has been appropriate in the in the sense that it was an emergency approach, and that you certainly wanted to be in a position that you were reaching out and that you were doing as as much as you uh, possibly could. And um, I don't have an answer to this, okay? But I think it is it is the standard uh, constraint and challenge in industrial policy about how you identify and how you support the viable companies, uh, but not, in a sense, exhausting a huge amount of resources to propping up those who, which are ultimately going to fail. So I'm not saying I have a solution to it, but I think it is a real, real challenge and a potential problem. Okay, thank you. So a couple of questions, we've got quite a few here. Start off, uh, Fergal McNamara from ESB, a uh, straightforward one. How um, to make sure in a practical way that the EU level stimulus is green oriented? Uh, Declan, there's a couple more specific ones for you. Uh, Derval Brennan of the Southern Regional Assembly asks about allocation of resources by region. Uh, don't know if you have any particular thoughts on that one, Declan. Um, Donald McManus of the Irish Council for Ho Social Housing also uh, pointing one to, to you, Declan, in Brussels around um, social housing. He acknowledges it's a national competence, um, but wondering around state aid rules, whether things can be changed at EU level to allow, um, to influence the social housing um, element. So Declan, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, if you're, I think you're still with us, but um, if anyone else wants to come in, um, Alan, I see you're unmuted there, so, oh, you're, you're muted now. Anyone want to come in on the, the green aspect uh, and how to, in practical terms, make the, uh, the changes, um, ensure that the, the, uh, the, the green agenda is included? I'll just give a quick response, Dan. Sure. 
On the, on the green issue, um, sort of a confession as, a, as an economist, um, if you go back a number of years ago, and I know Danny uh, worked on, on this when, it, when he was working uh, in narrower uh, economic fields, uh, but we used to think um, carbon taxes could solve everything, okay? but all you have to do from an economics perspective is get the price uh, of the emissions correct and, and everything else would be fine. Uh, the longer my life goes on and I look at the environmental issue, the more I become convinced uh, that carbon taxes absolutely have a role here, but major investments, system, you know, systemic change is really going to be required uh, here as well. So I think there, there is an opportunity now to, to look and partly at the scale of the challenge that we're now facing in, in, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, uh, that I really do think we, we need to uh, get a handle on this. Uh, and so the sort of public transport investments that have been muted for many, many years, uh, I think are very, very appealing. The retrofit, the redesign of buildings, all of those sort of things. Um, I, I, I think it's an area where a lot of thought has been given. So we use that old phrase, you know, the, the shovel ready projects. I think a lot of the projects are there are ready to go. If you go back six months ago, one of the great concerns was is that we didn't uh, have the labor force to achieve a certain amount of these objections. Uh, but I think now through stimulus packages, uh, EU included, there is the money. Uh, the labor may require a degree of, of retraining, but I think that's possible. But I think getting involved in those major uh, sort of retrofit and public transport um, type in, in initiatives um, I, I think they're really critical, and it's one of these things. There, there is an opportunity now. It's one of the not like good news, but uh, it, but, but it's uh, something we can seize. Gotcha, Declan. Um, to those two specific ones, I don't know the regional allocation of funding, uh, social housing. I don't know if you have anything specific to say on those, or any more general points, responses to what's been said so far. Declan, over to you. Yeah, maybe on the how to ensure the package will be green. Um, I mean, the Commission has been clear that um, when member states make requests to access the uh, funding, for example, under this uh, new re um, resilience and uh, recovery facility, priority will be given to, pro you know, to, to requests from member states that, go, that, that are green and digital. Um, and, you know, we have a long experience uh, with in, in, in discussing with member states uh, these, you know, these types of projects. Um, you know, member states have or are in the process of submitting uh, energy and climate transition plans. Uh, we've, you know, discussions are already underway with member states on the, uh, the next programming period for, for, for structural funds, structural funds and investment funds. Uh, so I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, we will, uh, you know, member states will surely be anxious to make sure that they can access as much of this funding as they as, as they can and priority will be given to those requests which which, which go in the green and digital uh, uh, direction secondly if you, if you take some of the lending instruments for example uh, invest eu where we would take a guarantee from the community budget uh, and then use that to crowd in private investment um, a lot of this again will go to projects that uh, are in the green and digital field. Um, and here we can also build upon the work that has been done um, by my colleagues uh, in DigiFISMA on sustainable investment. And here, you know, where you know, the, the sort of methodologies and typology of what constitutes uh, green projects, what constitutes uh, green, green bonds and green issuance. So I think we're, we're, you know, we're, we're putting in place the, the, the infrastructure that will allow us much, much better to, to um, you know, in, in an accurate way, tag investment projects as being genuinely, genuinely green. Maybe a final point, it's, it's also perhaps worth considering on the financing side, how we could uh, you know, use the initiative to, to advance the green agenda. So I mean, the, the, the commission now will have to uh, borrow uh, if, uh, large amounts of funds on, on financial markets. Um, and, you know, consideration could be given to at least part of that being, being financed uh, through green bonds. Um, so, so I think there's many dimensions through which we can advance the, the, the green agenda here. In terms of the, the, the social housing, of course, social policy does remain a, a national competence. But, I mean, we have seen with the social pillar um, that there is scope to uh, use the semester, use dialogue and exchanges uh, at European level to advance the, 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 the social agenda. Um, now, also, I think, you know, there will be scope 
for countries that, I mean, in terms of making requests for additional funding going forward, I mean, why not invest it? Why, why, I mean, why not use uh, that in part to, to, to advance social, uh, social housing? And there's lots which could be done in terms of retrofitting existing social housing to, in terms of their energy and efficiency. Um, it's also, of course, uh, you know, housing is extremely, you know, it's a labor intensive business. So it's precisely the types of uh, you know, labor rich uh, or employment rich uh, investments, which, are, which, which look like they would be you know, very beneficial at the current juncture. On the regional question, I have to say, I, I could, perhaps you could just be a bit clearer on the question itself. Is it, is it regional within Ireland or regional across member states? I think generally across member states. The NUTS 11, um, um, I'm afraid the question is gone now as I, as I um, moved it off the agenda, but uh, there was a spe specific mention of NUTS 11, that, that uh, um, detailed geographical breakdown. Perhaps. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Look. So let let me let me go back to uh, Patricia and Danny on on social dialogue. Um, you know, very briefly, Patricia, how how would you see social dialogue, the sort of social dialogue that you want to see differing from pre two thousand and eight? You're muted there, Patricia. You'll just have to. I'll take. So so I I uh, think that it could be very different. I mean, I don't see social dialogue in the way we're speaking about it, dealing with uh, pay issues. Uh, you know, there is a perfectly operable, um, from the public sector point of view, uh, there's a, a negotiating unit there, Public Services Committee of Congress and the government as the employer, so they get on and do their business in the normal way. Um, there has been over years now, um, local um, discussions at the various, um, uh, company levels and so on. We have uh, some sectoral employment agreements with some registered employment agreements. So I don't see that being um, a topic on social dialogue. And, and I also think that, you know, the notion that we in, in some shape or form replace or attempt to undermine the Oireachtas and the elected members to Parliament um, and to the Senate, I don't think any of that uh, should, should formulate or be seen to be uh, operating. I think social dialogue is about um, attempting to influence uh, the policy decisions um, that need to be either redeveloped or adjusted. If so, if you take housing, if you take any of those. So, Alan, I wouldn't necessarily over-interpret the, um, the agreement between myself and Danny because I would say that we probably agree in principle but when we come down to get to the details of what it is we want to achieve I would imagine there would be robust enough um, conversations but what we do and we've had this conversation individually with one another what we do agree with is a good strong social dialogue model whereby you can set out um, what, what, what you think are the ingredients to um, develop or adjust a policy in a particular area is the best way to do it and i think that that would be an additional an addition to politicians and indeed to public officers who are developing that i think all of that um dialogue and uh, so on would be an addition rather than than something that would be regressive so i i, I would see that not replacing anything or, or the, the position of Rockus people or anything else, I would see that as being uh, some very helpful to them and, and additional to them in terms of ultimately they have the responsibility and we're not trying to in any shape or form create a model tries to replace that. Danny. Um, we may as well disagree with Patricia. At least you think it's all uh, sweetness and light between us. Um, I, I think the Social dialogue is different to the social partnership, to use those terminologies, because where we find ourselves are completely different. Um, I think a future social dialogue will be allocating resources, not from um, the first social partnership, which actually was about the individual. It was about taxation and getting people, first of all, to get them a job, to allow them to stay in Ireland and to take some of the uh, returns from their efforts to um, be allowed them to make choices at their own individual level. I think to Alan's point, the market economy has delivered on that. And in fact, Ireland's been one of the most spectacular beneficiaries of globalization. I think where things are beginning to go askew is that we don't actually provide the public services now in sufficient quantity. 
they actually don't pay enough taxes in terms of a commission taxation that needs to broaden the base. And so that some of the features that have really come up here is in terms of the income protection model that our social uh, model isn't actually allocating resources to provide those collective goods like public infrastructure uh, to provide the connection between the business and the households. So I actually think that's where social dialogue is going. Uh, around the individual receiving it as an individual wage, I think it will be around the societal creation of services. I and mean, that's where it's going to be more dramatic. And the one last thing I would say is that the reason I think that the European social semester and European project is that we know from the past, Ireland missed out on industrialization in the middle of the last century, so missed out on some of the problems and how things were mediated. The social dialogue structure and social partnership is a very European context, which we made up on the hoof in reaction to Thatcherism, actually in Ireland, I would argue, uh, for the last social partnership. This time around, that whole idea of individualism and actually having representative groups, I don't think we need to think any more long-term than just last year. Think about what happened to the Irish Farmers Association in not being able to mobilize when you had difficulties around collections around the uh, beef disputes. Uh, there's a real danger when things end up on the street that societies really suffer from not having mechanisms by which to get the social actors together quickly. And so we should not be blasé in this country about the fact of some of the forces that we've seen go from the street into some of the actions uh, to think that our, that our system is actually immune from, uh, from some of those social uh, forces. And so the absence, I think, of social dialogue has been a dangerous mode for us over the last 12 months. And in fact, we might have got lucky uh, in the one thing that COVID actually uh, demonstrated the need for that kind of collective action, because there is a lot of precariousness, not just about low pay, there's a lot of precariousness in our society and in our model right now. And I think social dialogue can be helpful in that regard. Okay, I'm going to change tack. Danny, keep, keep throw, throw this one to you. Fionn Jenkinson, an economist with the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform, asks if workers losing their jobs in some sectors, the, the, the more vulnerable ones right now, could move into construction, where there was, until recently, a labour shortage. So do you see, from your knowledge of those industries, do you see that being possible? And a follow-up, is this recession going to hit the non-residential construction sector and residential construction sectors to the point where there won't be a demand for increased labor? Any thoughts around that? Um, so dif difficult enough questions actually, but I'll, I'll, I'll offer a, a view may not be accurate. Um, really it's around the retraining, reskilling and having that capacity to ensure that we can move people between sectors in kind of transferable skills. Um, because increasingly the sophistication, even in construction, is not the lump of labor uh, idea of the past, quite a sophisticated model. So the answer to that, I would think, is yes, that there should be a lot of complementarity between these skill sets that uh, a laborer versus a, a tech person. It's clearly distinction is there, but they're not as extreme as they would have been in the past. And the other one, which I think is just very short term, um, one of the features we're finding in the last three weeks is that because we know there's a lot of savings, there's going to be a lot of demand. The demand side of the economy is going to come back really fast. Problem is going to be on the supply side in terms of workers showing up because a lot of people have left Ireland during this crisis, may or may not be coming back. Um, and um, so those who are unemployed in one sector may find that very quickly there is going to be quite a heavy demand for labor in the economy pretty quickly. Now that may be a triumph of hope over experience, but right in the short term, um, I think that we might see some of those labor shortages develop uh, quite quite significantly again, that we get back on the rails fairly quickly here. Okay. So, the we have um, so I might come, Declan, come back to you on that point about the skills um, percentage share of the population with, with lower digital skills. A lot of questions coming in around that. Kevin uh, Callanan, the Secretary General of the Force Union, um, asks about uh, labor market activation programs uh, and whether these can be funded by EU 
uh, level funding and new EU level funding. Uh, we've got a question from Breed O'Brien of the uh, Irish National Organization for the Unemployed um, around the digital skills piece as well. Um, so could I ask, uh, ask you, Declan, to, to maybe elaborate a bit more on the active labor market programs, the digital gap, um, and Danny's very upbeat view that we could have labor market shortages rather than mass unemployment. Yeah, no, thank you, Dan. So, I mean, the, the, the figure I referred to is one of the indicators we monitor in the social, um, social scoreboard. Um, and basically what it says is that 53% of the adult population have overall basic or above basic levels of digital skills, but that compares to an EU average of 58%. So Ireland would be five percentage points below the EU average. Um, so it does point, you know, to, to some, some, some polarization. There's uh, many, many very highly skilled uh, people in Ireland with digital skills. Um, but it probably, you know, obviously there's an, there's, a, there's an age component there. But I suspect that quite a lot of this could also be an urban-rural uh, divide. And I guess there's also an income, uh, an in an income divide as well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, I think there's also, you know, you, you know there's been some some of the surveys which have been carried out in response to um, uh, homeschooling or online online classes, and, you know, 40% of, 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 of principals are reporting, um, you know, that you know, are, are talking about the existence of a digital divide within within their schools. Um, so I think th this would be, I, you know, it, it's, I think what some of the other panelists have been talking about in the sense that, uh, uh, Redistribution or inequality is not just income inequality. It's it's, it's access to to, to 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 IT and having the skills to to, to, to succeed and thrive in a, in a modern economy. Um, now, of course, the EU for a long time has been very very active in supporting uh, active labour market policies, uh, upskilling, retraining, notably through the uh, the European Social Fund. And indeed, it's this type of project which could receive top up financial support. Uh, from this additional um, recovery and resilience fund. I think this is precisely the type of project. Now, I can't be more precise than that because it's at the moment it's a proposal. All of the nitty gritty details will have to be agreed and worked out. But clearly, um, you know, the, the, this would definitely, you know, this, this, the, these types of programs that you refer to definitely go in the direction of, of uh, the, the, the digital agenda, which the commission has been advocating and also the skills agenda. Um, which, which uh, is in the process of being um, revised uh, in the course of this year. So I, th I think the short answer is yes, but okay, the details we will have to work out. Thanks. Good. So we're about four minutes left. Uh, Patricia, Danny, if you might have any closing, just closing thoughts. Um, but I'll go to Alan just on the issue of um, that question about active labor market programs, the, skill, the, the skills, the digital divide. Um, do you have any thoughts? in that area and were you surprised also by that chart of Declan on the digital skills? Well, let me, I, I was surprised when I saw it first, which I think was about six months ago. Uh, and I think it might have been at another IIEA event. Uh, and I, I do remember a discussion around the time where we were interrogating the data. And I think it, it might have been based on a question like, how would you rate your skills or whatever like that? And you know, there's this thing in Ireland that if you ask people about their health, they, they'd say they're grand and they're very positive. And you ask them about their skills, they can be quite negative. But I, I think what Declan said is probably closer to the truth, okay, in the sense that we think in terms of an Ireland with the Googles and the Facebooks and everything, and we think about it as this tremendously uh, technologically advanced society. Uh, but I think that that average figure is probably disguising uh, to, to extremes. But on active labour market uh, programs, I mean, it, Declan again is is, is right. Um, I think it, it could be the case now in Ireland we associate uh, EU expenditure with roads, you know, motorways and stuff like that because we see the signs as we're going by. Uh, but the reality is is that if a lot of people who went through sort of you know false training programs and other, if they had a sign on their back saying funded by the EU, there would be much greater visibility about the, the money that the European Union spent uh, in the 90s and in the, in the early noughties. Uh, and of course, you know, in, in terms of infrastructural investment, human capital uh, is just as important as, as, as other components. Um, and again, we know a lot through uh, research from people like Philip O'Connell, formerly of the SRI and others, about what works in this area and, and what doesn't. 
And so I made the point earlier on about sort of shovel ready green projects. There is also a lot of sort of, you know, readily uh, applicable human uh, capital projects as well, whether from EU funding uh, or, or, or domestic funding. So lo lots of potential there. Okay. Um, Patricia, Danny, if, if I don't mean to throw put you on the spot, but if, if you do have anything, if you don't, as you uh, wish. Well, I would just say that um, I, hello. Yep, we can hear you. I, I just think that it is a, um, we have a, a moment, we're at a particular juncture and we have an opportunity um, and I think we should use the opportunity. And from my perspective, um, we have the potential to make a strong recovery, but it's not just the recovery of the economy, it's the recovery of our society. And I think that we should put uh, equal emphasis on that. So the place that we need to get to is, we need to get to a place where everybody has equal access to a health service. Everybody who needs a home has one. Our social security system should be reformed to um, underpin uh, a proper income for people. So those sort of uh, elements, our economy is well capable of delivering that. Our society needs it to happen. We need to focus on, you know, getting rid of the inequalities that are there. Uh, we could go into that in, in most, in a lot of detail. So from our perspective, social dialogue offers, offers us an opportunity to do that. And when we talk about just transition, I, I have to say, we need to do an awful lot more work to get just transition into a space where it's going to work for us because the Board of Mona example tells us that it's not working for us at the moment so we 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 have a lot of work to do but we've a seminal moment and we've an opportunity to improve and to, to to remedy not just the economy but to remedy our society fractures as well thanks patricia danny do you want to yeah i think i just echo that same point really it's that this time around um we know that this is a wealthy society and even in the last couple of months <clears throat> it's a transfer from the state into the households, we see savings were incredibly high, another three billion uh, gone up in savings in a month. So in other words, the solution is within. And so a bit like this semester itself, the coordination among Irish society uh, offers us this opportunity. Uh, it's, not, it's not like the great financial um, situation at all. It's probably diametrically opposite in the Irish context is that we have the resources, but we don't have the channels in which to move that down. This is, this is a classic, Galbraith problem of private affluence and public squalor. And that's an easier thing to solve uh, than the corollary. Okay, on that upbeat note. Before thanking everyone, I'd just like to flag to, to participants and the audience here. Uh, we've got a very busy week over the rest of this week. We've got Louis uh, de Guindos, the Vice President of the European Central Bank, uh, President of Ireland, Michael D. E. Higgins, and Mairead McGuinness, the Vice President of the European Parliament, over the course of this week alone. So uh, a busy week and some great presentations to come. So with that, let me thank uh, Minister McEntee, uh, Declan, um, uh, Patricia, Danny, Alan, um, and our partners, the European Commission, for, for this session today. Hope you found it interesting, and thank you all for attending, and thank you for participating. Thank Good you. afternoon.